Life Audio. Christian Parent Crazy World with Katherine Seegers is brought to you by Life Audio and is part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational, faith-affirming podcasts, visit lifeaudio.com. Welcome to Christian Parent Crazy World, the podcast that tackles tough topics to help you be a godly parent in an ungodly world. I am your host, Katherine Seegers, and in today's episode, we will tackle this vitally important question. How do we teach our kids the Christian worldview? Such an important question, moms and dads. Now, I did a four-part series on the Christian worldview very early on here on CPCW. It's been like a year and a half, so those episodes were six through nine, for those of you keeping score. If you missed those, definitely check them out. In that series, we talked about why we need to teach our kids about other worldviews, what those other worldviews are that are competing for their attention, what makes the Christian worldview so distinctive, and how it creates the world we all want to live in. Mm -hmm, Great series. But what I didn't talk about is how to teach the Christian worldview to your kids. Honestly, it takes a very special skill set to break down the Christian worldview for tweens and teens and especially for our little kiddos. My guest today is an expert at doing just that. Yep, we're going to talk about how to teach the Christian worldview to our kids, even the really little ones. That's the plan for this episode of Christian Parent Crazy World. So let's get started. Once in a generation, a podcast comes along with the power and eloquence to inspire us all. This show will entertain you while you wait for that one. Join two best friends, author and former history teacher John Driver and comedian Johnny W. for hilarious and authentic conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. You can listen to Talk About That wherever you find your podcasts or at lifeaudio.com. My guest today is an incredibly gifted, highly accomplished former elementary school teacher who recognized a need for kids to have a curriculum that teaches them the Christian world view. Several years into her teaching experience, Elizabeth Urbanowicz realized that despite being raised in Christian homes, being active in church, and even attending a Christian school, her students thought more like the culture around them than like Christ. Elizabeth began searching for curricular materials that would equip her students to think critically, helping them to discover that Christianity is the worldview that lines up with reality, but she didn't find any materials that met this need. So Elizabeth went back to school, adding a master's degree in Christian apologetics to her master's degree in education, and she began creating a worldview curriculum herself. You got to love that can-do attitude. Elizabeth saw a need and she filled it and you're going to be so glad that she did. That curriculum is called Foundation Worldview. It teaches children the foundation for seeking truth in all aspects of life, helping young people to see that everything we find in the world around us lines up with the worldview presented in school. Scripture. I could not be more excited to have Elizabeth Urbanowicz joining me today. Elizabeth, I'm so excited to have you here. Welcome to the program. Oh, thanks so much for having me on, Catherine. It's a joy to be with you. Oh, I am so excited about the work that you are doing with the curriculum you have. It's called Foundation Worldview, but I think we ought to probably start for our parents by defining what a worldview is. Can you help us with that? Absolutely. Well, anytime I'm defining something, because my background is in elementary education, I like to use words that elementary students can understand, mainly because Mm. then I'm sure most people can understand them. (laughs) So whenever I'm explaining to someone what a worldview is, I say that a worldview is like a mental map of what we believe is true about life, 
and the world around us. And it affects the thoughts we think, the words we say, and the things that we do. So this worldview is our mental map of what we believe is true. Ah, that's so simple. That's so great. I'm, you know, I've been studying Christian apologetics and we have like bigger, lengthier terms. Trying to break that down for little kids is not easy. And you do that so, so well. So what do we want to ask then when we're contemplating what a worldview is? Like, what questions do we need to start with? Like, which worldview is the best explanation of reality, right? Is that what we're trying to get our kids to understand? Eventually, we want to get them there. Yes, you know, to, you know, as Christian parents, we know and love and trust Jesus. And we genuinely believe that scripture has given us an accurate picture of reality. And we want our kids to get there as well. So ultimately, you know, that is the goal that they would understand that like, oh, we're not just believing the Bible because it's like what people in our family have always believed. Like we're believing the Bible because it actually lines up with reality. And then we choose to submit ourselves under its authority. So now getting there, getting to that end goal takes many little building blocks along the way, you know, trying, I think like, you know, just, just trying to get there immediately would be like standing at, you know, on your porch and saying like, okay, in one jump, I want you to make it to the roof. And it's like, oh my goodness, are you kidding me? Like no one's going to be able to do that. So it's like, okay, what are the little building blocks we can use to get our kids, you know, to the roof where they're understanding like, oh, Christianity actually lines up with reality. I'm so glad you said that because I think too often it's it's hard for us as parents to figure out how do we break this down? What are those little steps? You've kind of figured that out for us, but I want to start by talking about what brought you to the conclusion that Christian parents really needed some other resources to teach our kids the Christian worldview? Where where did you, along the line, see that, okay, there's a gap here, there's a hole, we need to be teaching our kids about the Christian worldview? Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, my story is probably similar to many of the parents listening to this. You know, we have these plans for what we think our life is going to turn out like, you know, and then God ultimately guides us in different directions, which, you know, even though not always easy are ultimately, you know, for his glory and for our good. And so I, you know, 10 years ago, if you told me I'd be sitting here with you today, you know, chatting about a company that I run that creates apologetics resources for children, I would have been like, Apollo, what Like, what in the world are you <laughs> talking about? Yeah. Um, so it's just, you know, I never imagined that I'd be doing this, but I, you know, God has created me as a teacher. I love teaching. And when I was teaching in a Christian school, I was teaching fourth grade and then third grade. And I just noticed that the students in my classroom, you know, they came from these great Christian homes. Like the majority of the parents at our school had their kids there because they wanted them to be discipled through their education, you know, through a distinctly biblical education. And then I'm passionate about God and his word. I knew I was giving them a biblically based education all day long. Most of the families were involved in a local church, Mm -hmm. but I still saw the students in my care rapidly absorbing ideas from culture without any question. You know, they knew all the Bible stories, they knew all the Bible verses, but then when it came to, you know, like hearing the latest Taylor Swift song or like seeing a YouTube video or having a conversation on the playground, they weren't able to translate what we had been learning, you know, into their act- their daily lives. And so that just set me on a journey. I just thought, you know, what if I could start an after school class that would just teach kids how to think well? And so I got permission from our head of school to do that. And then I set out to find resources to help me with that. You know, like I'm like, okay, where's the curriculum for this? Yes. So I looked and I looked and I looked and everything that I found, it was, it either fell in one of two camps, either it was for high schoolers, which I'm very grateful those resources exist. I was so grateful. But I was like, man, if I'm seeing these problems like at eight and nine years old and we wait until they're 16, like that's a lot of lost ground. And then the second problem, like there was a few like little mom and pop shops or, you know, like smaller homeschooling presses that had like textbooks that taught some of these things to younger kids. But the problem was, is just with the way that God's designed me, you know, there are many, many, many things I am not gifted in. But one of the areas I am gifted in is being able to look at a concept and understand how to break it down into the necessary steps so that someone's mind is going to be transformed. And so as I was reading through these materials, I was like, oh, like this is like a good paragraph of information here, a good paragraph of information here. You know, this has a word search or a crossword puzzle, but I'm like, that's not what transforms kids thinking. So that just led me to start creating my own resources. And never with the intention of like publishing or anything. I was just like, (laughs) I care about these kids, you know, and I want Mm -hmm. them to know and love and trust Jesus all the days of their lives. So I started creating my own resources, taught it in an after school class. Like it went super well. 
And the kids were just kind of shocking me and everybody else. Like moms were calling me and they were like, um, so my son wants to pause family movie night and evaluate the character's worldview. <laughs> Great, but I don't know how to do this. I need some help. And then <laughs> teachers from older grades, like I, I allowed third through sixth graders in the class and teachers from the older grades were coming down to me and were like, how are you getting these kids to think so deeply about like history and mathematics and literature? Like I've never even thought this deeply about these subjects. I'm like, I don't know. I'm just like teaching them some basic skills and they're running with them. Mm. So Anyway, after, you know, a couple of years of seeing that transformation in kids, people from around the country started contacting me, asking me how they could get our hand, their hands on what I was doing. And I was like, you can't, like, I'm a third grade teacher. I'm not a publishing house. Read these books, mm-hmm. take these classes, you know, create your own stuff. And everybody was like, yeah, no, just let us know when you have it published. And so <laughs> eventually after three years of receiving those kind of requests, I went back to school to get a master's in Christian apologetics from Biola, just to make sure that I really knew what I was talking about. And then halfway through that degree, I stepped back from teaching to start Foundation Worldview. And so the goal is just to just to really give Christian adults and specifically Christian parents the tools that they need to be able to equip their kids to think well, to carefully evaluate every idea they encounter, and then to understand that the Christian worldview lines up with reality. Because, you know, I'm not a parent. I don't have children of my own, but I know from my friends how busy life as a parent is. I know as a classroom teacher, how difficult it is to educate a child, you know, and also to take care of them on a daily basis. And so my goal and our goal at Foundation Worldview is we just want to provide the tools that adults can use so they don't need to go and get a degree in apologetics. So they don't need to go and learn, you know, how to design instruction. They can just press print and play and they can sit down with their child, you know, and implement resources that are going to really transform their thinking. That is awesome. And that's what it is. I started using it a few weeks ago and I'm loving it. I, you know, I've heard you speak in other venues about how, uh, what some of the things you were seeing and the students that made you aware that this was really necessary. Can you share some of those stories with us? I want the parents to see, okay, this is what's happening in Christian circles. We, we are teaching them the Bible stories. We are sending them to church, but it, too often, all too often, so much of the culture is seeping in and it's getting intertwined and mixed and they don't know where to find ultimate truth on the topics and on all of the issues of their day. So can you speak to that a little bit? Hey there, it's Nicole Yunus, host of the How to Study the Bible podcast, where every single week we join together to encounter God through his word. You can subscribe at lifeaudio.com. Yeah. So I, I saw a number of situations in my classroom, just some of the more humorous ones. I, I think they're fun to share. One of them, one afternoon, I was walking around my classroom. I had just taught my students a new lowercase cursive letter. You know, I had modeled it for them. We had practiced it together. And then it was the time for their independent practice. So I was walking around the room, you know, just trying to help them and make sure that they were creating it correctly. And one little girl had made the loop on her J backwards. And so I said, oh, sweetie, you know what? That's the way that we make a loop for a lowercase F. But a J goes the opposite way. And so cute. She was this cute, she was just this adorable little girl. She was, um, she was half Indian and she just had these big, beautiful brown eyes. And she looks up at me with all seriousness and she goes, don't judge me. <laughs> and I like burst out laughing. Like I just burst out laughing. She says this with like all seriousness. And I was like, right. okay, this is not what I was expecting to come out of her mouth. And I was like, okay, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this for a second. You know, like, what does it mean to judge? We talked about, you know, to judge means to tell whether something is right or whether something is wrong. And then I said, well, let's think about the cursive letter J. Like, is there a right way to make the letter J? Mm -hmm, There is. And are there some wrong ways that we could try and make it, but it wouldn't really be at a letter J? Yeah. And I said, okay, so as your teacher, is it my job to tell you whether or not your letter J is correct? Yeah, that is my job. And I said, what do you know? It's my job to judge your letter J. So let's get moving. (laughs) Um, But just, you know, that's a that's like a lie, just it's so prevalent in our culture, yes. just, you know, moral relativism that, you know, something can be right for you, but not right for me. And it's going to change from person to person. And as long as we just don't judge anyone else, you know, like we're all good. Well, we just know life doesn't mm-hmm. work that way. Like it doesn't, whether we're talking about, you know, like construction, like, you know, like when when the architects were building, you know, designing the house that I live in, you know, it wasn't like, just like, oh, well, you know, like for you, the foundation is going to be this, this square footage by this square footage, but for somebody else, it could be different. It's like, no, they needed the exact plans, you know, for that. But then when we're also talking about the sphere of morality, like we just know inherently that certain things 
are right and certain things are wrong. You know, if that weren't true, then we think when we think back to, you know, like the Nuremberg trials after World War II, Mm -hmm. we would have no reason to claim that what the Nazis did was wrong. So anyway, just, I was like, man, you know, like even at the age of eight, like this student has bought into cultural relativism. And then I also saw like another fun story Another day in my classroom, the projector had gone on the fritz. Like I was teaching with a smart board, the projector went on the fritz, you know, so I was like, okay, everybody calm down, go back to your seats, you know, work on this activity. I'm going to figure this out. So my students are working on an activity. I'm standing up on top of a desk, like trying to like fiddle with the wires on the projector. And I hear one of the boys in my class say, guys, this is really stressful. I think we, we totally need to meditate to stay calm. And so like just weird things, you know, for like an eight or nine year old to say, and I'm also not really good with balance or good with heights. So I'm like, okay, let me get my bearings and get off this desk before I address this comment. And so I get my bearings, I climb down off the desk. And by the time I'm on the ground, half of my class is seated on the floor with their legs crossed, with their arms outstretched, you know, like with making a little circle with their hands, eyes closed and going, um, and I was like, oh my gosh, like when did Eastern meditation hijack my classroom? (laughs) So I was like, okay, I need everybody to stand back up, get in your seats. We're going to talk about this. And I talked about like, okay, like what did you automatically think of when you thought of the word meditation? Mm. You thought of getting down, crossing your legs, emptying your mind and making this humming sound. And I said, that, that is not what the Bible talks about when it's talking about meditation. When the Bible talks about meditation, it means filling our minds with God's word. What you just did, it comes from Eastern religions that are trying to empty our minds of everything and become one with the universe. And there was just like blank stares on my students' right. faces. And I was like, oh my goodness. So just these and so many other situations in my classroom, I just saw that like, okay, what I'm doing in Bible class is not translating <laughs> you know, into their everyday life. Right. What can I do to help bridge this? So it's not just like Bible is one class or one part of our lives, right. but it actually permeates everything that we do. That is awesome because we do that. We have a classical Christian education. And that's one thing that we talk about that, mm. that Christianity, God is at the core of everything. All the other subjects surround it. It's this beautiful, this beautiful diagram they have that, you know, it's God is at the center. Then you have mathematics. You've got history. You've got the arts. You've got science. You've got every other subject, you know, your languages all the way around. And we talk about how God is incorporated into all of these other subjects and how he is glorified through all of uh, understanding all of those other things. Unfortunately, like you said, so much of the world today, obviously out there in the culture, but in the church as well, has become they've become Christian relativists. I was, uh, we've talked a lot about uh, on this show, the recent statistics from Barna that show that only 4% of Gen Z has a biblical worldview. And yet, according to Barna, I think it's somewhere close to 60%, 59%, I think, are identify somewhere as Christian or Catholic, you know, as a belief in God, some sort of a, a following based on scripture, you would think, and yet only 4% of them have a biblical worldview. So we've got a huge discrepancy here, meaning that the overwhelming majority, especially in Gen Z, but even I think with baby boomers, it was only a 10% biblical worldview. The overwhelming number of Christians who claim to be Christians or who claim to be Christ followers don't have a biblical worldview. So how do we go about then? Like, what are the essential things we need to start teaching our kids to ensure that they're that they are in that 4% because the overwhelming majority of the people they know both inside and outside the Christian faith don't hold that worldview. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think that's a really great question you're asking, you know, like, what is it that we actually need to do? What do we need to have in place? And I think that there are two very specific things that we need to do, you know, that encapsulate a lot, but are two different veins. And the first thing that we need to do is we need to actually ground our kids Mm. in scripture. Like they can't have a biblical worldview if they don't know what the Bible says. And so I'll dive into that a little bit more in a minute. And then the second thing that we need to do is we need to prepare them to carefully evaluate every idea that they encounter just because of the prevalence of information. So the first part of that, actually grounding our kids in scripture, so much of what has been traditionally done over the past 50 years, you know, in Bible instruction, whether it's been in the church Sunday school or in kids ministry, or even just in a Bible curriculum, whether that's for a Christian school or a homeschool setting, 
is either kind of like going through random Bible stories, yep. you know, which is kind of like what children's illustrated storybook Bibles do, or else, you know, like picking out a theme, like some predetermined theme that we already want to teach the kids, you know, like respect or kindness or missions or love, and then like pulling different Bible verses out to support that. And now I'm not saying that either of these things are inherently wrong. Like obviously like doing either one of these things as opposed to not doing them is better, (laughs) Um, you know, than not doing them. However, if we want our kids to have a biblical worldview, they need to understand what the narrative of scripture is from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. They need to see it as one cohesive story and they need to be prepared to soundly read, interpret, and apply scripture on their own. So that's the first thing that we need to do is really immerse them in scripture and equip them. You know, in every other area of life, we're trying to equip our kids to be independent. You know, we teach our kids how to do laundry so that one day when they're not in our house, they don't walk around wearing dirty clothes. You know, we teach them how to turn on the stove, how to turn on the oven, how to measure, how to mix, how to cook things so that they can one day feed themselves. You know, we teach them how to drive so that, you know, when they're of age, they can drive themselves to their job or to, you know, wherever they're going. But for some reason, we don't tend to do the same thing with scripture instruction. We tend to even like read a devotional, read a storybook Bible, you know, maybe do like a family devotion in the evening, but it's like, well, what are we doing to actually equip them independently on their own to seek God through his word? Because there, there's certain skills that are needed, <laughs> you know, to actually approach the text of scripture. So that's, that's one foundational thing that I, that I think we really, really need to do if we want our kids to have a biblical worldview. And the second thing that I mentioned is to equip them to carefully evaluate every idea that they encounter. Because, mm-hmm. you know, when, when we think about this cultural context in which we're raising kids, that one of the things that this is marked by is the prevalence of information. Now, that's not always a bad thing. You know, having, you know, the internet at our fingertips for, you know, for doing research, for, you know, Google mapsing something, you know, like these things can be like really helpful tools. However, sometimes we don't recognize that raising kids in this day and age is vastly different than raising kids before 2008 when the iPhone was invented. Yep. And so our kids in one year of their life are going to be exposed to more competing ideas than most adults throughout the course of human history have been exposed to in their entire lives. You know, so what we need to do is we need to give them skills to actually filter through all of these messages. And so that involves, you know, teaching them to, you know, just to understand the objective nature of truth, Mm -hmm. to just ask themselves, what is this idea that I've heard? You know, so they're stopping, they're pausing and being like, okay, what did I hear? And then to logically evaluate those ideas Mm -hmm. and to recognize, okay, does this come from a worldview that aligns with scripture or does it come from some alternate worldview? So I think those two things, grounding our kids in scripture by equipping them to read, interpret, and apply it on their own, and then giving them the skills that they need to carefully evaluate every idea they encounter. Wow. That was amazing. I'm going to, after (laughs) I'm going to rewind and listen to that advice several times. (laughs) You're so, you're so on point there because so many of the curriculums for little kids, like you said, it's wonderful. You want them to understand, you want them to know these stories, really important truths come from the stories from David and Goliath and from Noah and from, uh, from Moses, all of these stories, they're vitally important, but grounding in those principles. And I think, I think some parts of the faith have done that better uh, than others. They, my, my mother-in-law was Catholic. She grew up Catholic and the catechisms on some level, they said, Mm -hmm. okay, we're going to go through. These are the foundational truths that you need to understand. I'm not saying they always did it well. And I'm not saying that, that, I mean, honestly, you know, she, she converted after she got older and her, her faith wasn't real or vibrant. She really didn't have a relationship with the Lord, not I'm not trying to make any statements there of Catholic versus Protestant, but you know, that's not something I think we've done a great job with, especially in evangelical Christianity is setting that firm foundation. What do our kids need to understand about the Christian faith? What makes it distinctive? What exactly do we believe? And that is what I've really enjoyed. You know, I've been homeschooling for 10 years now and I've done all of that. I've, I've done some really good things, some curriculums out there, but like you said, one of them gets really good towards the middle school later, you know, years. I, I was having a hard time really finding anything that works for the young ones all the way through. And I love it because I started yours. And your, your curriculum, Foundation Worldview, with my six and my eight-year-old especially, and right off the bat, start talking about what is truth. And then you 
take a really deep concept, the correspondence principle of truth, you know, that truth is what corresponds to reality. And you break it down in ways and you had these really fun little exercises that we were doing for the kids. Truth is what is real. And so we would make statements that were true and my kids would true, you know, they would have their hands going. They loved it. Elizabeth, they love this curriculum. They were, they were, they've been begging to do it. They've been having so much fun with it. And then of course you've got the scripture memory and I loved where you started with the scripture memory. Cause I started, and, and not that there's a right or a wrong place necessarily to start, but you picked one of the verses I think is the most important in all of scripture. I started with John 14, six with my kids, you know, I'm the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. And so they, I, I, we memorize a lot of scripture, but you started with John 1837, right? Where Jesus is talking mm-hmm. about for this reason I came, for this purpose I was born. You simplify it. I, I We learned a longer version to testify to the truth. And I'm like, wow, think about that. And I've thought about this before, but breaking it down for the kids, if that's his entire purpose for coming, first of all, it tells us truth is really important. That's That's his purpose above and beyond salvation and redemption and healing and all of the other wonderful things he he did truth was the primary purpose because if you don't have truth you can't have any of the other stuff the other stuff comes from understanding who he is and what is true and also that that counteracts one of the big narratives i see in progressive christianity right now is that we can't really know what is true if that was jesus's primary purpose for coming then he failed epically if we can't know what is true. If the word that brings us his truth, which he is the word, right? He is in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. He is the word. So if we can't know that, then he's either a failure or maybe, maybe we're, we don't have the right theology there. We can know what is true. So I'm hats off, kudos, applause, standing ovation. I'm loving going through this curriculum with the little kids. What other things do we need to be making sure our kids understand the essential foundational aspects of the Christian faith that they need to know in order to have a biblical worldview? Yeah. Well, I think the list is probably very long on that yes. one, but I always like <laughs> I always like to simplify things and say, let's just bring a few things. Yeah. Yeah, let's just take it one step at a time. So the the first thing that you talked about with the concept of truth, that is really foundational. And that's one Mm -hmm. um, that's often skipped over just simply because of our cultural context and us just not realizing how vital that is. Because what you mentioned before, you know, the correspondence of theory of truth, that truth is that which corresponds with reality or how we say it for little kids is truth is what is real. Exactly, And that is a concept that is not outlined step-by-step in scripture, but it is everywhere assumed. Mm -hmm. And it's been assumed throughout all of human history, you know, really up Mm -hmm. until the last 200 years when it started to be questioned. And it wasn't even questioned, you know, so much among like the everyday average population until about a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that we just at Foundation Worldview, we find all of the time that that people are shocked to realize that their kids have bought into the lie that truth changes from person to person. So like the curriculum you're referencing is our early childhood worldview curriculum. And that's our first one and most basic one. Then the next one up, which is our uh, comparative worldview curriculum, it does the same thing in setting a biblical foundation for a worldview, but it also teaches what other worldviews in our society teach. And then it has the kids compare and contrast those beliefs so that they see that Christianity lines up with reality. Well, in, I think it's the fifth lesson in that it's either the fourth or the fifth lesson in that curriculum. We actually have the kids at the beginning of a lesson. They're given the question, you know, is the truth true for everyone? And then they're given a sticky note and they either have to decide, yes, it is, or no, it's not. And then they have to justify their answer and explain it. And we get emails all the time from parents and ministry leaders and Christian educators that are like, Oh my gosh. (laughs) I had no idea (laughs) that most of the children got it placed in my care thought, no, the truth is not true for everyone. Now, the good news is by the end of that lesson, the majority of the kids are convinced that it is true for everyone. They're able to explain that, but that's just a really shocking thing because we're just swimming in this culture of relativism and we don't really understand Mm -hmm. sometimes how much it's even affected our kids. So I think that's the first thing, because, you know, you mentioned before John 14, six, 
And it's such a powerful verse, you know, talking about how Jesus is the true representation of God, that he, because he is God and he is the only way to God. But if we don't establish the objective nature of truth first, what our kids are really hearing when we memorize that verse is Jesus is the way for some people. He's the mm-hmm. truth for some people. He's the life for some people. Or it's like, no, that's not what he said. And that's not what the people <laughs> in the first century would have understood him to be saying. Or um, even in the 18th century. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, that's that's very recent. Mm hmm. Yeah. So it's so important that we first establish that, you know, just that what truth is. And and with that, God's relationship to truth, that he is the source of truth, that all truth stems from him because he's the creator and sustainer of all reality. Now, I wouldn't say to a five-year-old, he's the creator and sustainer of all reality, <laughs> um, but we would, we could say, you know, he is the source of truth. And we just teach kids, you know, like, what is a source? You know, we talk about like mm-hmm. the source of water, you know, <laughs> like the source of water is the mm-hmm. rain that, you know, that we drink in our houses, the rain that falls, you know, what is the source of wool? Sheep are the source of wool? What is the source of most of our eggs? Chickens are the source of most of our eggs. You know, who is the source of truth? God is the source of truth. So just get establishing that. And then the other questions that we cover in the curriculum, because I just think, you know, they're not the only questions to cover in a worldview, but I think they're so important for little ones to understand. The next question we look at is who is God or the question, Mm -hmm. what should I worship? You know, like who is ultimate? And so just looking at some of the basic characteristics of who is God as he's revealed himself in scripture. And actually this is so important. Important. Um, while we're recording this episode, I'm, um, we're actually getting ready to film another curriculum for four to seven year olds or four to eight year olds on the attributes of God, where we actually dive into 25 whole lessons on like, who is God? Because, you know, even 25 lessons don't exhaust that, mm-hmm. but, but it's better than five. So we look at that question, you know, who is God? Then we look at the question, how did life begin? Well, this oh. might seem like a strange one, you know, just mm-hmm. for the average parent to think like, you know, I love it. (laughs) Yeah, but it's super important for them to think through, you know, is there, is life purposeful Mm -hmm. or is it accidental? Because the answer to so many questions is based off of that. You know, you even just think about what's going on in our culture right now where people just think, you know, what I feel is the most real thing about me. So if I feel like a male, it does Mm. not matter what body that I have. My feelings determine reality. You know, if I feel like someone has treated me in a way that makes me feel unsafe, that is accurate. I'm going to cut that person off. And when you think back to it, that actually stems back to this ultimate belief that, you know, life is accidental, that there is no inherent purpose and meaning in life because we weren't created. We're this accidental product of blind, unguided evolution. So therefore we determine our own destinies and, you know, we're the one that creates meaning for our life where if we've actually been designed with a purpose, Mm -hmm. then our purpose is not something we invent. It's something that we discover. (laughs) And so um, just talking with kids about that and showing them that, you know, it's not We don't close our minds off to what reality is when we say that God created the world. Like we give them examples, you know, just little, just little games, you know, like where they see like a a jumble of, of uh, Scrabble tiles or banana grams tiles on the screen. And we're like, does this look like it was created on purpose or by accident? You know, it looks like it was created by accident. Could it have been created on purpose? You know, could somebody have taken them and placed them this way? Yeah, it could have been. Then we look at another group where it has words that are spelled out, you know, like life contains information or something like that. And we talk about, does this look like it's purposeful or accidental? Well, it looks like it's purposeful. Why? Because it's arranged in an order, you know, there's a pattern to it and it gives us information. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about, well, could this have happened accidentally? No. And then we, you know, we actually give kids the opportunity to, you know, like shake up, you know, letter tiles in a solo cup and like try to spell a word and it doesn't work. And we talk about, we see this all the time. You know, we look at a bicycle and we're not like, wow, those pieces came together and made something amazing. It's like, no, there was a designer behind this because there's a purpose. So that's a really important question for our kids to understand that the Bible speaks to that very clearly that God is our creator, but also when we honestly open up our eyes to the evidence around us, we see design and intelligence in all parts of creation. Um, so the first three questions, you know, like what is truth? Who is God? How did life begin? Then the fourth question we cover is who am I, or what does it mean to be human? Because that's something that's so confused in our culture right now, you know, And so we just look at, you know, humans being purposely designed. When we look at our bodies, you know, like there's just, you know, there's design all over them and there's purpose Mm -hmm. to every part of our bodies. And that lines up with scripture talking about us being, you know, God's creation, God's image bearers. We talk about, you know, gender and how gender is purposeful and it has a design to it. We talk about, you know, that we're both body and soul and that that's, you know, clear and, you know, everything that we see 
And then the final question we look at is how can I tell right from wrong? Mm. Because as, as we've talked about before in this podcast, you know, this cult, just this moral relativism Mm -hmm. is so prevalent in our culture. And, you know, sometimes even within the church, it's like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, we, we might not agree over everything, but that's okay. You know, we can all love one another. Where there are certain places where that's obvious, you know, Romans 14 Mm -hmm. talks about, you know, different people having different convictions over things to which scripture does not clearly speak. But it doesn't say that, you know, like about things that scripture clearly speaks to. And so right. we just take kids through exploring that question, you know, like, um, is, is it the government that gets to decide the rules for right and wrong? Or is the government responsible to a higher authority? You know, is it just, you know, everybody in the community comes together and they vote on the rules and that's yeah. how right and wrong are determined? Or is the community actually responsible to a higher authority? Or, you know, do we just listen to our hearts and our hearts tell us, you know, what's right and what's wrong? Or, you know, is there some higher authority we have to listen to? So these are just five basic questions. Again, they're not mm. the only ones, but they're really foundational for things that our kids need to understand in order to just walk through this cultural context in which we're living, to be just aware of the different messages they're going to be receiving from you know, the media, from friends, from culture in general, and then to just know how to live faithfully as Christians in a secular culture. Oh, we have such such a big task as parents trying to help our kids navigate all of this. And I love what you're saying. It reminded me of something uh, William Lane Craig said, ultimately, we really aren't postmodern in our thinking. We aren't really relativistic in our thinking because it breaks down logically very quickly. If you're looking at a bottle of rat poisoning, he says, as opposed to a bottle of medication, and you're trying to figure out which one to consume. We all believe in objective reality when we're looking at, at medication bottles, but somehow when we're looking at other issues we think we have we can we can pick and choose and determine what is right and wrong uh, we're really not relativists we want to kind of come up with our own ideas of what that is and we want everybody else to agree with it but it's like you ju- you were just saying do we have a ni- higher authority well if we know that we're designed and we seem to be designed with a purpose in mind then then we need to investigate what that is and perhaps who that is. And, you know, of course, that's what we're trying to teach our kids to do and wanting them to be lights and witnesses and a very dark culture so that they can reach out to their friends and their other loved ones, perhaps who don't who don't believe in that. We have really covered a lot of ground here. And I'm so excited (laughs) because you have agreed so graciously to give us a little bit more of your time and to stick around and talk about, you have a list of the seven most pernicious, I think, lies that our culture is uh, foisting upon our children right now. So we're going to talk about that in the next episode. I know you're not going to want to miss that, but can you just tell us then where our listeners could find out more about Foundation Worldview and about you? Yes, hopefully it's easy to remember if you remember the name of the company. If you go to foundationworldview.com, you can find all of our resources there. We have webinars that we host. We have a podcast that comes out twice a week. We have a book club, but we have blogs. And then we also have our curriculums. So all of those resources can be found at foundationworldview.com. That is awesome. So awesome. And I wanted to to mention, well, first of all, it, it's so obvious as I'm going through this, because I did a four-part series early on in Christian Parent Crazy World on worldview, but breaking that down for little kids and understanding all the elements of what we need to teach them is a skill. You were talking about your skill sets. That is in your wheelhouse. That's not, you know, I do homeschool, but it's not necessarily in mine. And I, you know, I, I like all of the parents in my listening audience, we're so busy finding resources that we can really use that are truly valuable. And by the way, I, I, having done homeschooling for 10 years, I think is a very economical curriculum to add to a list. It's something you can do if your kids are in public or private school, add it on during the summers. And I'm just, I'm very excited to be using it. And I'm also very grateful because you have graciously offered CPCW listeners a coupon for $10 off any curriculum by using the coupon code CPCW10. Again, that's CPCW10 to get $10 off any family license. Quick side note here, just so you know, I don't receive any financial incentive if you purchase this curriculum neither does this podcast or life audio and by the way i purchased it with my own funds with the exact same discount that you guys are getting mamas and papas we have got 
to teach our kids what the Christian worldview is and why it's the best representation of reality. Eventually, we'll get there by building all of those building blocks. If we want them to hold fast to the Christian faith, when they get out on their own, they can't keep what they do not own, and they can't own what they don't know. It's our job as parents to teach them. Tools like Foundation Worldview will make that job a lot easier for you. Now, how is our culture chipping away at the Christian worldview? Well, There are seven specific pervasive lies, as I was mentioning earlier, that our culture is selling our kids. Are they buying? In the next episode of CPCW, Elizabeth is going to stick around to share those lies with us. Trust me. You don't want to miss that one. And head on over to at Catherine Seegers on Instagram and Catherine Seegers Speaker on Facebook to see clips of my interviews, inspirational quotes, and personal messages. Please make comments on the podcast, give posts a share, and drop me a line there. I would really love to hear from you. I want to thank you for joining me today. Look, I know. There are a lot of things you could be listening to right now, and I really appreciate that you took this time to spend with me. I hope you will join me for my next podcast when we take aim at some aspect of our culture that threatens to derail our parenting and steal our kids' faith. If you enjoyed this episode of Christian Parent Crazy World, would you consider telling a friend and sharing it on social media and giving it a good review over on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and following me on Facebook and Instagram? Oh, oh, and maybe you could say that Christian Parent Crazy World is the best podcast you've ever heard in your entire life. Uh, just a thought. Uh, and be sure to check out my website, which is katherineseegers.com. That's Catherine with a C. I have lots of articles and resources there that will help you on your parenting journey. And if you subscribe, I will be sure to send you some really cool free stuff and notify you of future podcasts, articles, and blogs. I want to end this and every episode with a word of encouragement. God gave you Your kids, your specific kids for a reason. That's because you hold the key to unlocking who God created them to be. We'll see you next time. Christian Parent Crazy World is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you liked what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review this podcast in your favorite podcast app so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. Hey there, it's Nicole Eunice from the How to Study the Bible podcast, and I'd love to invite you to join us as we weekly discover a passage of God's Word together. From beginning to end, from principles to practicals, we are here to make sure that God's Word is powerful and relevant to your life. If that sounds like something you're looking for, I would love to invite you to subscribe. You can go to lifeaudio.com and search How to Study the Bible, and we'll see you there.